God says you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and we're in my series, Written in Stone, learning what the second commandment says about how to identify the idols in our lives. In this message, I've entitled Idolatry and Divine Jealousy. If you have your Bible, please turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, as we continue in our series on the Ten Commandments titled Written in Stone. Mark Twain, the great writer and humorist, he was uh, talking to a man who was well known as a ruthless businessman. And as they were talking, the businessman said to him, he said, well, you know, uh, Samuel Clements, you know, Sam, I, I really have a desire in my heart before I die to go to the Holy Land. And he said, I want to go to Mount Sinai. I want to climb Mount Sinai, climb to the very top and recite the Ten Commandments. And Mark Twain said to him, well, that's, that's noble, that's admirable. But he said, what if you did this? What if you stayed in Boston and kept the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Harder to do. Well, our series is entitled Written in Stone because that's what God did with the Ten Commandments. Written in stone, the Bible says, by the finger of God. Nowhere else in Scripture do we have anything that God Himself wrote. We have Jesus who wrote on the ground in John chapter 8 when the woman was caught in adultery in the very act, but we don't know what He wrote on the ground. But we know exactly what God wrote as He etched in stone His Ten Commandments. Now, they're written in stone. They're not penciled on paper. They're not carved in the sand. If they're penciled on paper, they're subject to erasure. If they're carved in the sand, they're subject to erosion. These are written in stone. These are solid commandments that God gives to us, and He doesn't give them to us willy-nilly, just haphazardly. And the Lord appears on Mount Sinai to Moses and the people and says, well, let me think. Well, what could I, well number one, let's try this. Number two, let's try this. They're not ten suggestions. They're ten commandments, and they're given very carefully in order, systematically given, meticulously laid out. Now, they're given for our benefit and for our welfare, for our blessing, for our good, and ultimately for God's glory. So let's look again, Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh your Elohim, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, no other gods alongside of me, no other gods rivaling me, no other gods before my face. That's commandment number one. Commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the sea. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, Yahweh your Elohim, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, commandment one and commandment two really fit together strongly because in commandment one, we learn how, uh, the God that we are to worship. 
And in commandment two, we learn how we are to worship this God. They really fit together, and there's a little bit of overlap in those as you're going to see. But here's our question. Well, what do we learn from the second commandment? Because there are some things in there that I just read that you might say, perk up your ears, God's a jealous God. God visits the iniquity of fathers on children to the third and fourth generations. That doesn't sound right. So we're going to look a little deeper than just face value and see what the Lord is saying here. So two discoveries this morning from the second commandment. Discovery number one, God is not to be worshipped in a carved or created image. We don't worship God in a carved or created image. Look at it again. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water or under the sea. You shall not worship them or serve them. Now, the people, they, they're all from Egypt. They grew up in Egypt. All they saw was what was going on in Egypt. Egypt's very pagan. Egypt has lots of gods, lots of idols, and they're worshiping all these things. That's what the people came out of. And so God is giving them something way, way different. Now, when you read the second commandment, if you're not careful, you can say, well, you can't have any kind of images in worship because God is making it very clear, don't make any images when you worship me. But it's hard to imagine that's the right interpretation because the Lord tells Moses in the book of Exodus how he's to make the tabernacle. And it's very, very uh, elaborate, this tabernacle and the, the furniture in the tabernacle and what they're supposed to put on it. And so you have, for instance, the menorah, the golden lampstand. Well, that, that lampstand, if you'll notice on the, the uh, branches of the lampstand, you have almond blossoms. Well, the Lord says that's how you're supposed to make that, Al almond blossoms, and you have three on each one of the stems, and you have four on the main branch that goes up. Well, that, that was made to order. God said that's how you do it. You think about the Ark of the Covenant that Indiana Jones is, you know, he found that in uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, incidentally, this isn't in my notes, but they're making another Indiana Jones movie. Harrison Ford is 79 years old. He looks like he's been rode hard and put up wet. It's not quite, it's, don't get excited about this is going to be another Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's not. But here is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, notice in the Ark of the Covenant, what do you have on the mercy seat at the very top? Well, you have the two angels with their wings touching. Those are the cherubim. Well, if you take the second commandment and misinterpret it, you say, well, you could never make anything like that because that would be wrong. That's making uh, an image of angels. But God told them to do that. Here's the thing. God is not against images in worship. He's against the worship of images. And that's what he is saying. And the people came out of a background where they worshiped images, where they worshiped idols. And God says, don't do that. So here's the question, well, why? Why can't we make an image of God and then worship through that image to worship God? I mean, we know that's not really God, so we're just worshiping through that image to God. Why does God not want us to do that? Three reasons. Number one, the presence of God cannot be localized in an image. You can't say, well, this is God, you know, as they're going to do in Exodus chapter 32, when Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, the people say to Aaron, Moses' brother, hey, we don't know what happened to Moses, so Aaron, make for us a God that we may worship. And so they make the golden calf. Probably looked a lot like the golden calf in Egypt because they worship the bull in Egypt. They called that false god Apis, A-P-I-S. And so uh, they say, that is your God. Behold your God, O Israel, that brought you up out of the house of slavery. God can't be localized like that. Uh, there's a great name for God in Scripture, Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. The Lord ever-present. 
As Solomon said, when he built the beautiful temple, and in his prayer, he said this, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house, house which I have built. I, you know, God, that was God's house, the temple. But to say, well, that, that is, we, we worship the temple, and they started doing that. They said, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They started to worship the temple. This is God's house. This is where God is. This is the presence of God. This, this is in this ark. This is uh, our God, and we worship him. God can't be localized like that. But it was very easy for them to do that. And so you read in 1 Samuel chapter 4 where they're fighting the Philistines and Israel is getting defeated by the Philistines so they lost 4,000 guys. And they said, what's the deal? What do we need to do? And somebody says, we need to go to the house of God. Now, at that time it was in Shiloh. And we need to get the Ark of the Covenant and we'll bring it into the battle. And that's like God coming into the battle and everybody will see the Ark of the Covenant. And so they got Hopni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, and they brought, uh, they were priests, they were rotten to the core. But they brought the Ark of the Covenant and everybody cheered. Whoa, the Ark of the Covenant. And the Philistine says, what is this? They said they have brought their gods into the battle. And this has never happened to us before, the Philistines says. They were scared to death. These are the gods who defeated Egypt. That's how the pagans thought of it. And the Israelites are thinking along the lines of the pagans. And what happened? They got routed in battle, and the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. Now, they didn't want it for very long because they took the Ark of the Covenant and they brought the Ark into the house of their god, Dagon, who was half man, half fish. And uh, he didn't fare well before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And then they all got uh, tumors, literally hemorrhoids. Everywhere the Ark went, they, the Philistines got hemorrhoids. And they said, get this out of here. Uh, we don't want this anymore. Uh, so God was showing that he is God, but you can't localize him in some object that you have created. Reason number two, God, not only can he not be localized in an image, the glory of God cannot be depicted in an image. How are you going to depict God? You can't. You don't, God is spirit. So how can you depict a spirit? You can't do that. And when God appeared uh, on the mountain, he didn't show any kind of image. And the reason being is, how are you going to create some image that could express the glory of God? Man cannot do that. But in the New Testament, when the Word becomes flesh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. And so we see the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. But even in that, even in Jesus, you don't see the glory until you get on the inside. On the outside, Jesus just looked like any other Jew. Uh, you know, none of the Bible writers in the New Testament ever give us any insight to what Jesus looked like. You know, isn't that strange? Doesn't it seem like somebody would say, well, you know, Jesus, he's five foot eleven. He, he had shoulder-length hair. He had this kind of build. I mean, his facial features look like this. Nobody tells us any of that. They don't talk about any of that stuff. The only one who gets close to talking about what he looked like is Isaiah. And Isaiah, the prophet says in Isaiah 53, he has no stately form or majesty that we should be attracted to him. No, no beauty that we should look upon him. What does that mean? Jesus is just a very ordinary-looking guy on the outside. All the beauty is on the inside, all the glory on the inside. And one time, he let the three disciples, his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, see on the inside. Remember, he took them to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he just pulled back the veil of his humanity, and he let them look at his deity, and he began to shine like the sun. And they said, wow, they were just blown away. They didn't know what to say. And they heard the voice of God, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. 
and they were with him on the mountain. Peter said, we didn't follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we were eyewitnesses of his glory. We were on the mountain when we heard the voice of the majestic glory say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And it's so funny. It, Peter always had to say something. He had foot and mouth disease. And so it says that they were just, they were in, in awe and didn't know what to say. And so not knowing what to say, Peter said this. You know, it's like, I got to say something. So I'm just going to say this. Lord, it would be good if we built three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Well, it was, it was not the time to say anything. It was just the time to worship. But here's the point that God is making. Don't make a likeness of me because there's no way that you can capture my glory in a likeness of me. So that's the second reason. Not only is the presence of God impossible to localize in an image, but the glory of God can't be depicted in an image. And thirdly, the worship of God must be in spirit and truth with words. In spirit and truth with words. Now, we know about the spirit and truth from John chapter 4. Jesus, with his experience with the woman at the well. And she begins to talk to him about worship. And he says to her, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we worship the Lord in spirit and truth with words. Now, in Deuteronomy, what is the book of Deuteronomy? It's Moses' last three sermons to the people before they go into the promised land. Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. God told him that. I'm not going to let you go in. You can see it, but you can't go in because you disobeyed me and you treated me uh, as common among the people, and that was a grave, grave sin. Moses, if you want to be real technical, Moses uh, committed the sin unto death that's talked about in 1 John chapter 5. And so Moses, his strength was not uh, abated, nor his eyes dim, the Scripture says, when he died. He was still able to go, but God says, you're retired, and uh, I'm not going to let you into the land. Well, this is what he says in one of his three sermons given to the people before they go into the promised land. He says, then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So watch yourselves carefully since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai, from the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth. Don't do it. Remember, when God came to you on Mount Sinai, you didn't see him. You heard his voice. God, could God have revealed himself to them in a different way? He could, but he didn't. They just heard a voice. And when people would see God, because it goes on to say that some of the elders of Israel saw the Lord. They saw his glory. What did he look like? Fire. He's a consuming fire. The only God we see in Scripture that we can actually see is Jesus. And, and sometimes in the Old Testament, you have a pre-incarnate visitation of the Lord, and he comes in bodily form. It's a pre-incarnate uh, visitation from the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, who walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day? Did they walk with the Spirit? No, I think they walked with the pre-incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now God the Father, the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. No man has seen God the Father at any time. And so we, we worship with words in spirit and truth. In the beginning was the Word, the Scripture says. And not, it doesn't say in the beginning was the picture. In the beginning was the image. No, in the beginning was the Word. And this is interesting in Revelation chapter 4, where John the Apostle is called up in, into heaven. He says this in Revelation 4, Immediately I was in the Spirit, 
And behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. Oh, tell us, John, what does he look like? And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And from the throne proceed flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Well, how would you make that is in an image? I mean, it's just metaphors that he uses. And, and it's just God is awesome, but he's never described in terms of, of things that we can see. Now, in heaven, the Bible says that, Revelation 21 and 22, that we see his face. God says to Moses, when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory, Exodus 34, he said, I can't show you my face, Moses. No man can see my face and live. So what did he show Moses? Remember, he hid him in the cleft of the rock and covered him with his hands. He said, Moses, I'm going to make all my glory pass by you, and you're going to see just the backside of my glory, the edges of my glory. You can't see my face and live. And so God is saying here, hey, don't make an image of me. Don't make any representation of me in some kind of a created image that you would worship because that would be sin, and you are not to do that. You can't capture my glory, and my presence can't be localized, and you are to worship me in spirit and in truth with words. Kevin DeYoung said this, in Christianity, we see by hearing. Hey, what does God say? He says, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six. 6, for the one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. It, we don't come to God by sight. We come to God by faith. And the scripture says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Many, many people saw the miracles of Jesus but you don't get saved by seeing the miracles of Jesus. You get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not enter into judgment but is passed out of death into life. You hear and you believe and we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth with words, not with images and not with uh, creations that we make, carved images, graven images, or some kind of a molten image that is formed into God. Now, as we said, this is the, the commandment that was given in Exodus 20. And then Moses, after the people get the commandment, because this wasn't just given to Moses on the mountain. This was given to all the people. Remember, they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us lest we die. God is scaring us to death because there's uh, lightning and fire and smoke and thunder and, and God's voice. They wanted to do the commandments. And then Moses goes up to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Oh, we don't know what happened to Moses. Make for us a God. God is not to be worshipped in a carved or created image. Discovery number two. God is to be worshipped for who he is, not for who you want him to be. For who he is. Look at it again. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the sea. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." What do we learn about God in the second commandment? Well, we learn about how we're to worship him, not with idols, not with anything we make with our hands, not with any uh, images, carved images, graven images. And we need to worship God the way God is, for who he is. Now, here's the thing that God tells us about himself in the second commandment. God is a jealous God. 
You say, well, that, man, that's terrible. Why would God, God's a jealous God? Well, he doesn't want me to be jealous. It says in Galatians chapter 5 that the deeds of the flesh, one of the deeds of the flesh are jealousy. And so God says he's jealous, and he tells me not to be jealous. Well, what's the deal? Maybe I'm reading that wrong. Well, if you're reading it wrong, let's go to Exodus 34, 14, where the Lord says this, for you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Just in case you didn't get it the first time, the Lord has a special name. His name is Jealous, and He's a jealous God. You say, I don't understand it. How can God be jealous and that be right? God is not envious. He is jealous. God is not jealous of you. How ridiculous would that be? God is jealous of you. I mean, it's like saying, you know, uh, God wishes he could play basketball as good as Pastor Jeff. <laughs> Back in the day, Pastor Jeff can't play anymore at all. And Pastor Jeff was never all that good. And, but, but he, you know, I get better and better as the years go by. You know, Back in the day, I was getting my hand over the rim, which is true. Anyway, <laughs> God is not jealous of you. That would be like the sun being jealous of a 20-watt light bulb. That's just crazy. God is jealous for you, for you. That's totally different. See, God created you and me. He created every single person. And as Blaise Pascal said, that God created us all with a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts. And the only thing that can fill that hole, that vacuum in our hearts, is God himself. So God is jealous for us because he knows that he has what we need. He is the one, the only one who can fill that hole in our hearts. As Augustine said, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until our heart finds its rest in you. And that's what God is saying. Hey, I'm jealous for you because I want you for myself. That's what God says. He's jealous for us because he loves us, and what he wants is you. What he wants is me. What he wants is our devotion to him, your exclusive devotion to him. Just like a husband and wife, when they stand at the altar, one of the vows is, and leaving all others, I will be to you a true and faithful husband, a true and faithful wife, wife, as long as we both shall live. And that is the thing about marriage. We share our spouses with other people in terms of socially, in terms of uh, their profession, in terms of conversation and things like that. But when it comes to the intimate part of life, we don't share that with anybody else. That's just uh, for the husband and wife alone. Well, God says, listen, you are mine. I bought you with a price. And so I don't want you going out on me. The Bible says that the love of the world, if if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does it mean to love the world? It means you're a spiritual adulterer when you love the world. Well, that doesn't sound good. You're, You're stepping out on God spiritually. You're a spiritual adulterer. Now, in the Old Testament, we read in the New American Standard about people playing the harlot. Israel would play the harlot after other gods. That's not good, but it doesn't sound near as bad as what it says in the King James. Listen to the King James, Exodus 34, verses 14 and following. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods." That sounds horrible, doesn't it? We don't like to use that word, but God uses it in His Word. That's what you're doing spiritually when you start to worship other gods. I'm a jealous God, He says. I want you exclusively for myself because I am what you need. 
Now you say, well, were the people really plagued with all this idolatry? Yes, yes. You know, the first time you run across the word idols in the Scripture, it's in Genesis chapter 31. Jacob is leaving with his wives and his children. He had served Laban. Laban was his mother's brother. He had served him for 20 years. And so he is leaving with all his uh, possessions, and he had a lot. He was a wealthy man. He was leaving with all his possessions, and Laban comes after him. And Laban was mad. Why? Because someone stole the household idols. Rachel was the one that took the household idols. Well, what were the household idols? They're called in Hebrew teraphim. Teraphim. We have a picture of some of the household idols. And, and they were little, uh, little carved images that would, people would have like on their mantle. And they would maybe be the size of a person's hand or maybe even smaller. Somewhere, something they could put in their pocket. And they would have all these, these household gods that would be like, well, this is the god of, of agriculture, and uh, he's going to help me with my farming. This is the god of health. He's going to help me with my health. This is the god of, of our family, and he's going to help us be fertile and have lots of children. They had all these different gods, and it was like uh, Laban was like, you took my household gods. How in the world am I going to make it if you took my household gods? Because they would inquire of these gods. They would be their counselors. They would be their comforters. They would be their helpers, the givers of earthly prosperity, the teraphim. Well, that's what we read about that in Genesis 31. They were doing that. All the people did that. God says, you don't do that in the book of Exodus. No more. Don't do that. You don't worship me that way because I'm a jealous God. I won't accept you having other gods before me and besides me. Well, you say, well, Jeff, they, you know, that's a long time ago. Uh, that's Old Testament stuff where they bowed down and worshiped and made these idols and stuff like that. We don't have that today. New Testament. Little children, last verse in 1 John chapter 5. Little children, guard yourself from idols. John Calvin said, the human heart is an idol factory. We were made for worship. And if you don't worship the one true God, you will worship a false God. And if you try and worship the one true God, but you do it your own way, as Cain did, then that's disqualified too. And so, uh, commandment number one, you worship the right God. Commandment number two, you worship the right God the right way. I love this definition of idolatry. It says, what is an idol? An idol is anything we depend upon to meet the deepest needs of our heart, love, security, worth, or significance. That's an idol. Hey, do you have something you depend upon to meet the deepest needs of your heart that is not God, different from God, something else? Maybe it's your money. You depend upon your money to meet the deepest needs of your heart. You depend upon your job to meet the deepest needs of your heart. You know what? is an idol that so many of us have. It fits in you. It's like a teraphim. It fits in your hand. It's this. This is your idol. You said, oh, no, it's not my idol. Parents, what would happen in your house if you took this away from your teenagers? I'm just going to do a little experiment. I'm going to take this away for two weeks. Your kids will freak out. They'll go full Laban on you. Who took my household idol? I had to get this back. And we have such an affinity to this, and we get, such, uh, we get such affirmation on this. Look how many likes I got on Facebook. Look how people like what I wrote on Instagram and, and all these different social media platforms. And so many people live and die by likes and comments and things like that. We get our 
security from that. We get our sense of identity from that. What's an idol? An idol is anything we depend upon to meet the deepest needs of our heart. Love, security, worth, or significance. Hey, don't, don't get the idea that we're so sophisticated we don't deal with idolatry. We do. And God wants your exclusive devotion and mine also. So, God is a jealous God. Secondly, God is a just God. So, what does it say about the justice of God? He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. The justice of God, you reap what you sow. And if you sow to the flesh, you from the flesh reap corruption and rottenness. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That is just built in to this world because God is a just God. You say, wait a minute, time out. It sounds like the, the children are getting penalized for the sins of the parents. But that's not what God means here. Look what he says in Ezekiel 18.20. The person whose sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the, of the righteous will be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. You're, you're not, I'm not going to pay for the sins of my father. That's not what God means. But here's the thing that we can't get around, and a good reminder, especially on Mother's Day, Children are clearly affected by their parents. The actions of their parents affect the kids. And, and your kids will be influenced by the way you act. I love this parenting advice. I think I got this from Jana Mayo. She said, when you have children, your number one job, mom and dad, is to behave. 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 Hey, you want your kids to turn out right? You want your kids to be honest and hardworking and you worship God in the right way and love the Lord and walk with the Lord? How does that happen? You be the person you want your child to become. You model that before them. This is how you walk with God. This is what it means to be a believer. This is what it means to honor God and please God in everything you do. You just follow me. That's what Paul said. Follow me as I follow Christ. Hey, I'm going in the right direction. If you follow after me, you're going to be following after Jesus because I'm following after Jesus. And God is a just God. And listen, parents, angry parents typically produce angry children. Fearful, worried parents typically produce fearful, worried children. Child abusers typically produce child abusers. That's what they grow up in knowing. I had a friend of mine, he's dead now, but he was a child abuser. He was abusive with his discipline, not sexual, but he was very abusive with what came out of his mouth and how he disciplined in anger. Why did he do that? That's what his dad did to him. That's what he knew. Hey, God is a just God. Now, here's the good news. See, on the negative side, you reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you'll from the flesh reap corruption and rottenness. But if you sow to the Spirit, what do you reap? You reap from the Spirit eternal life. You reap good things, and you see that in your family as they say, I, I want to have a marriage like mom and dad. I want to follow in the footsteps of mom and dad. God is a just God. And thirdly, God is a good and loving God. So he says, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. When I was in seminary, the first, one of the first classes I took at fall semester, I took a summer class, but then the, the real fall semester, I took Old Testament survey, Dr. Stephen Andrews. And I remember him saying this so vividly. He said, God, he read from that passage, and he said, okay, he visits the iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generations, but he shows loving kindness to thousands, to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. He said, God is skewed to the good. God is skewed to the good. 
And we say, well, we want a God that we can create, a God that we form out of our own mind, out of our own imagination. We want the God to be like we want Him to be. God is not who you want Him to be. He is who He is. I am who I am, He says. But who God is is so much better and so much greater and so much more glorious than your mind can fully comprehend because God is good and loving. Psalm 86, verse 5, David said, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Now, one other thing, and we'll be done. What does the Lord say? In verse 5, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You know what comes first in the Christian life? Worship. What is God looking for? Uh, God is looking for worshipers to worship Him in spirit and truth. There is worship, true worship. You worship the true God His way, and then there's service. You worship Him, and then you serve Him. Some people say, well, I don't really want to worship. I just want to serve. Uh Uh-uh. It doesn't work like that. You worship God, and then you serve God. You spend time with God, and then you do what He says. That is critical. You know, we have the picture, Luke chapter 10, Mary and Martha. Martha wanted to serve the Lord. Mary wanted to sit sit at His feet, listen to His Word, and worship the Lord. What did Jesus say to Martha? Martha wanted to do a good thing. Lord, I want to serve you. I want to have this great meal for you. Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things matter, really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me, and keep my commandments. Scripture says we love because He first loved us. Do you love God? How do you know if you love God? Because you keep His commandments. That's how you know. John says, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Do you look at the commands of God and say, oh, man. God, God says, I can't have sex until after I get married. That is so restrictive. No, it's not. His commandments are not burdensome. <coughs> His commandments are there to protect you, to help you, to safeguard you. You do it God's way, and you'll be blessed. You do it your way, and you'll suffer ruin. It's like that every single time. God really does love you and me, and God's ways are right concerning everything. And the sooner we get in line with Him, the sooner we experience His blessings. So one last fill in the blank on your outline. When you truly love God, you gladly obey His commandments and worship Him His way. My friend, we're all guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. We are sinners before God. That's why Jesus came. He came to pay the price for our sin. He came to be our Savior. He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, He will save you now and forever. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life, my heart, my all to you. Forgive me, cleanse me, save me, come to live inside me, change my life. And I promise to follow you all the days that you give me. In Jesus' name. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. If you just prayed that prayer with me, please let us know. The contact information is there. We wanna pray with you and help you any way we can. Listen, you're important to God and you're important to us. And we're here for you.